the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the race to build the world's first space elevator and a redeemed starship captain continues his fight. Plus, we continue our ongoing audiobook serialization of Timothy Zahn's Cobra, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's a pleasure to have you along. I am Bain Associate Editor and your podcast host, David Afshirab. This week, we bring you Sean C.W. Korsgaard's interview with Joelle Presby about her debut solo novel, The Debere Snake Launcher. Listeners may be familiar with Presby's work with David Weber in his Multiverse series. Debere Snake Launcher is a near-future science fiction novel that follows the race to build the first space elevator in Africa. Presby's interview with Korsgaard delves into both the hard science and social science of what it might take to make it happen. But first, the news. The November trade paperbacks are in. Let's take a look. First up, we have the Debere Snake Launcher by Joel Presby. The Chami, Chummy Fabrice's task? Bring together a nouveau riche West African family, two engineer sisters, an ambitious megacorp executive, the nephew of a powerful Bakwari tribal chieftain, and more. His mission? To construct the world's first space elevator in Africa, thus ensuring the space industry that it catapults will enrich the continent and all involved. They have the carbon nanofiber, prime land around Kilimanjaro, and a captured rock in orbit for the tether. The hard part will be getting all these different people working together long enough to see it built. And next up, we have The Trinity's Children by Dave Barra. Admiral Jared Clement has returned to Trinity. With his promotion comes increased responsibility that weighs heavy on his shoulders. 30,000 settlers are leaving the dying planets of the Rim, his home, and resettling next to the natives of the planet Bellus. Clement is responsible for those lives and the lives of the natives, Trinity's children. But when his migrant fleet arrives in the Trinity system, they are faced with enemies both old and new. With just a small military fleet, Clement is faced with the almost impossible task of defending both his people and the natives. That's the Debere Snake Launcher by Joel Presby and Trinity's Children by Dave Barra, both out now in trade paperback. And that's it for the news. Welcome back, listeners and viewers. I am editor and media and military liaison, Sean C.W. Gorsgaard, here with Joelle Presby to discuss her debut solo novel, The Dabare Snake Launcher. And of course, for all of our veteran listeners, I wish you all a happy Veterans Day and thank you all for your service. Something that, as we will get to, Joelle knows quite a bit about. So... Before we begin too much, Joel, for all of our listeners who might be seeing you for the first time, introduce yourself to the Bain Free Radio Hour listeners. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me on the show again. Uh, it's, it's been a few years. Um, I'm a, a Navy veteran who grew up in West Africa, who has written a little bit with David in his Honorverse and co-written in the multiverse with him, and I'm very excited to be now releasing a book with only me as an author, not you know one of fifteen collaborators, and and a very fun anthology. But this is this is just my book, the Dabare Snake Launcher. Thank you. And for all of you folks who may want one of her books at home, we have The Road to Hell, which she co-authored with David Weber, and The Dabare Snake Launcher out this month, and part of our ongoing Veterans Day sale. So. Tell us a little bit about the Dabare Snake Launcher. Um, Dabare Snake Launcher is a, a, a book zero. Um, so it is standalone. Uh, there, there will be more stories. I, in fact, already have a contract from the wonderful Tony Weisskopf for 
for the next book, but it will it will jump forward a, a little while. If you read to the end, you will perhaps get a hint of why you might want to jump forward a little while for for the next story. Um, it's a it's a not a single main character story. It is a story about a whole lot of people who have this amazing opportunity. There is there has been discovered a way to make diamond wire, which is the one thing we, we need to actually build, build the space elevator. This book right here, for you audio listeners, it is Space Elevators, an Assessment of the Technological Feasibility and Way Forward from the International Academy of Astronautics, is a real science book with a whole lot of engineer PhDs who got together and wrote about different aspects of what it would take to build a space elevator. And in the back, there's a bunch of reasons why it can't actually be done at all. However, those reasons all come down to, actually, if you had a lot of money and you had the political will and you had one science change, we really could do this right now. Isn't and that, that all one science change problem. is we need a material. What's that, Sean? Isn't that always the way with space travel, though? Well, no, sometimes, sometimes you need a very big change to make it the work. The will and the money. In this help. case, well, well yeah, the, the money is, is always helpful. Um, in this case, what you need is carbon nanofiber. And we already have carbon nanofiber. We just don't have it long enough. When I started writing the draft, um, my search of Google Scholar said that we could make about nine centimeters of it. When I finished the draft, we could make about a half meter of it. Um, but we would need basically from the surface of Earth up to geosynchronous orbit for a space elevator, which is roughly 22,000 miles, which is a little bit more than what we can do now. So that was, I made that my one scientific science fiction gimme is we've got diamond wire. And then all these characters have all their individual choices for, are they going to look at this big pro big project and try to steal a little bit for themselves? Or maybe not even technically legally stealing, but make just a, a small adjustment because it's a giant thing and maybe it'll never actually be finished. And so maybe their one little thing won't make that big of a difference. Or are they going to sacrifice? And for each thing, time by time, they have to decide. And it, it's a fight as people realize that things they did in the past that they thought weren't going to be a big deal maybe are because of what other people did. And there's villains and heroes, and we get to find out if they get it or not. I have to admit, reading the Dabare Snake Launcher, that was certainly one of the big joys, is that you have this wonderful dramatis persona filled with interesting characters with conflicting goals motivations desires out of the project that by both design and circumstance manage to mesh together long enough to perhaps pull this off mm -hmm. what went into writing such a strange group of characters like this and were there any inspirations for some of these characters especially uh Ch especially uh, chummy, if you may, really like. <laughs> well, I part of why when I was reading the the science that I really wanted to do this is I learned that it would really be much easier engineering wise if the base ground station for the elevator was very close to the equator, and also it would help a lot if it was on a mountaintop that was non-volcanic and stable and really the one place on planet earth that would be great for that is Mount Kilimanjaro. And also the nature of how the planet earth works, um, it would be really nice to have other, maybe multiple spaceports near the equator who could launch things up to help with the construction phase. And so I grew up in West Africa in Cameroon and the part of Cameroon I lived in um, was similar culturally to Appalachia in the United States with people who are salt of the earth, uh, a lot of grit and drive to make things happen without 
actually a lot of money without necessarily the tools that would be perfect, but they were still going to make things work. And there were a lot of engineering creations, which if you open the first page, you'll you'll see the the definition of the word dabere, which is a, an engineering kind of creation that is amazing with all the different pieces that have been mishmashed together to make it work. And everybody is in awe of it. And sometimes it works flawlessly and sometimes it works not at all and is total waste of all that time and effort. Did I finish answering the question or I get distracted off in my... Oh no, marvelous answer. And at least one other thing, for anyone who hasn't seen the beautiful cover art and rear art for the book, the sisters are, of course, a great contrast in the book. What was the decision to have such a, cousins, rather? What was the decision yeah. to have young yeah. viewpoint characters for the construction of a space elevator as opposed to the corporate side or the business side of things? You have these two young female well, side. I, I, I also enjoyed telling the, the corporate side. I. After my time serving in the United States Navy, I was a corporate consultant for Booz Allen Hamilton. And so those, the, the culture of corporate consulting where really financially it's in the best interest sometimes for your company to continue problems rather than solving them. And that conflict of someone who's trying to do right, but it's really hard to to want to do right if you realize that your family gets to eat if you don't do the right thing. People can have their brains turn around. And so there that that experience and meeting and, and having those kind of interactions with people in that part of my life inspired a lot of the characters for the the big company TCG that's building the the space elevator itself. But for the supporting space station in Cameroon, uh, many tribe-related um, family or family business industries, it's going to matter who you are in relation to the matriarch or patriarch of the family. And so people who wouldn't have gotten a start in a management position in their teens, except that their family, it just made sense to me that it would have to be people who were in the core family who were going to run a family business building a space station. And the way things work out with families having dysfunctions and maybe even more dysfunctions if they're rich, with more money, more problems, it seemed more likely that they would be cousins who were among the, the younger generation and had the skill and drive to work hard than that they would be siblings. Now, that it, you kind of touched on one of the other, I guess, writerly aspects I'd like to ask you about, that you have, you struck a balance between new money, old blood, multinational, international, as a writer, was that challenging? And how did you tackle it with such gusto? <laughs> to some extent, I, I was wanting to write things that were interesting to me, but that I hadn't seen done a lot in other people's stories. That if, if I want to read the story, I have to write it. And, and I was very pleased with the positive response I got from Bain. There were there were a few early readers that I shared drafts with who gave me some feedback that this will be impossible to market and don't be surprised if you get told you have to remove the elements of mysticism if you have to either make the characters 12 years old or make them 50 years old or do, do these changes for the purpose of marketing rather than because what you did works best for the story. And, and I have... Thank you, publisher. You are wonderful. You, they, they let me do what I thought was best for the story. And in fact, gave me suggestions to tweak it to make the story even stronger with Joelle. I thought you were trying to do this, but it hasn't quite come through in this early draft. So what if you changed it in this way? And yes, yes, that's what I need to do. For our listeners and viewers at home, Joelle is being a bit too modest. This was the first book I actually <laughs> edited at Bain. And uh, 
there wasn't that much that need be changed. I think the big one was just adding the definition of dabare to the beginning of the book and a bit of explanation to, without revealing too much to those who haven't read it, and of course, shame on you if you haven't yet. The Mamiwata, could, for our viewers and uh, listeners, explain a bit about her. Uh, Mamiwata is a very important um, mythological figure in Western Africa. If if you grew up near the coast, um, she's a more likely to be an evil character who, who drowns people in the undertow of the ocean. If you grew up closer to the Sahara, because she, she is a water spirit. Um, she brings fortune, both positive fortune and misfortune. And she is extremely powerful. Um, if you make a deal with her, you better keep your end of the bargain or you will suffer and everyone around you will suffer. Uh, but if you if you live closer to the desert, uh, she's viewed more positively because water is life and with her comes water. And it, it might be disease laden water or not perfect water, but water is life. And I will say you've threaded the needle of the mystical and the technological very beautifully. But what was the decision behind? Well, I viewed it as a matter of faith. There are characters who have faith in different things. There are characters characters who have faith in humanity. And there are characters who believe in Mami Wata. And I, I gave them them equal equal weight on and I I leave it to the reader to decide what is real and what is not real. Now, before we get a bit more into background, I would be remiss, and I'm sure the David Weber fans would let me know that I would be remiss if I didn't <laughs> ask about multiverse. I hear there have been some developments on that front. Yes, I I am not recording from home. As, as you can tell, I don't have a pile of, I, I don't have my library behind me like Sean does. Um, I'm recording from a a family member's house that I've been staying in near Greenville. Uh, David and I have been meeting these last two days working on the fourth multiverse book. It is very close to being ready to submit to Bain. Uh, our working title right now is The Fourth Circle of Hell, but we might have a better idea. And if I'm not mistaken, it is the first of three new multiverse books, correct? It it is the first of three on a contract for three, but um, it is the concluding final triumphant finale for the the war between Sharona and Arcana. And the we have at least two more books after it, and they will begin a new phase. So for all of you who haven't quite tired of walking the road to hell, be sure to give those books some love when they come out. Now... I have to ask just because you have been writing for Bain for nearly a decade. How did you get your start? Uh, it's all my husband Andy's fault. Um, Andy works for, for NASA right now, but back when, when we met at grad school, he was getting a degree in aeronautics and spacecraft engineering. And when you are a science fiction fan and you have degrees like that, you tend to get collected by science fiction authors out there. And one of those collectees was named David Weber. Um, it so happened that David Weber was nearing the point where he was going to have, be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the first printing of On Basilisk Station. And Tony Weisskopf uh, suggested that he might uh, put together some of his very lengthy backstory notes into a encyclopedia sort of document, um, a companion. And David had also many contracts with Bain for novels <laughs> and a, a, lot of, a lot of work to do and didn't want to not deliver on his novels. So he and Tony Weisskopf came up with the idea that the people who had been supporting David as tech first readers would actually write this encyclopedia. 
And so nine people, including my husband, got together and formed a legal corporation in order to sign a contract with Bain. And um, together they were going to deliver uh, the House of Steel Honorverse Companion. And Andy was going to be very um, important in a leadership management role to make it all happen. And he very much intended to do all that, but he was also active duty Navy. And between signing the contract and finishing the manuscript, the Navy gave him a new job. And he went from having a 40 hours a week job to having an 80 hours plus weekends job. And as so the military does. I saw this as the family name is at stake. Our honor is, is, is being potentially being maligned if we fail to deliver and our word is, is broken. And so I, I stepped in and, and worked with coordinating with the other eight and uh, having been an officer and project manager certif certified person on the, on the government uh, consulting side, I, I was able to, to do my part and help the others do their part so people didn't do the same work and it got turned in on time and it got published. Um, and I'm very proud of that. But I, because I was associated with the BU9 people, I got to hear when Tony had another small request for David Weber that Bain.com, which has wonderful free fiction and free nonfiction monthly, that it would be really nice for the release of that Honorverse Companion if there were an Honorverse short story available for free on the website. And David had written a potential short story, uh, but I believe it came in around 45,000 words. And so actually it got added to the Honorverse Companion and was printed with it. It's a little long for free fiction. <laughs> And so David turned again to View 9 and asked, hey, would anybody like to try their hand at writing an in honor of a short story? And the other people kind of looked at each other and there was crickets heard. And I decided to write something. And I, I wasn't very confident in it, but I wrote something and I shared it with Andy. And without talking to me, uh, he shared it with Tom Pope. Nobody talked to me again. And Tom Pope liked it too. And Tom shared it with Sharon Rice Weber. Again, nobody talked to me. Sharon liked it. She gave it to David. Nobody talked to me. David gave it to Tony and Tony contacted me to buy it. So that, that was the beginning. And the rest, as they say, is history. And not long <laughs> after that, you contributed to one of the Worlds of Honor anthologies. How long after yes, that? Yes, and uh, then the road to hell. How long after that did David rope you into uh, multiverse travel and writing? Um, it was, from my perspective, I wrote a thing, I submitted it, it got accepted, you know, with, with edits. And then before I had time to go back to, to anything else, I, I had a, a contract for the next thing. It was all one after another. Now, you've done short fiction, you've done novels, you've written solo, you've had co-authors, you've written in shared universes and your own. As far as a writer's background goes, you've danced with a lot of different dance partners. What's that like? Well, when I get offered an opportunity, I, I try really hard to say yes. And especially if it's an anthology that's a little far out. Um, I have really enjoyed being able to learn from a lot of different editors. Um, I'm going to share some of my secrets here and this might cause other people to be a little hesitant to work with me, but when an editor gives me an opportunity to write with them and there's several months before a thing is due, I try to find something that fits with what they need but I'm not totally sure my skills are there. And I write it quickly and I turn it in and I, I let them know in my email, you know, I tried to do a new thing and I appreciate your editorial feedback. And if this is not what you want at all, I have enough time before your deadline that I can write a, another thing that fits with your requirements and is not stretching my 
my skill set. But I've, I so far, knock on wood, um, because I turn things in early, editors are willing to give me the additional feedback that is needed for me trying to learn a new thing and using them as my, my unpaid teachers. Now, the other thing is, in addition to Dabare this November, early next year is going to be a very interesting time for your short fiction. I hear you're <laughs> going to be in not just another honor verse anthology, but you yes. are one of the authors. We've got Chicks and Tank Tops coming out. Tell us a little bit about your story in Chicks and Tank Tops. Uh, my Chicks and Tank Top story is actually set in the, the Dabare universe. Um, a, a relative to, uh, to the nurse character who's in chapter one, who's pretty a minor character in the Dabare Snake Launcher, um, is a, a, a member of the National Guard in, uh, in Virginia and they are have been sent to deal with a a hurricane and it's this is a few hundred years in the future there have been some wars since between now and then and the guard has has received surplus uh military materials as guards often do from the the more army navy air force marine corps kind of more frontline militaries and so she has a tank that is her hobby tank that was provided by the guard and she has converted it quite a bit and 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 able to use it as a very all-terrain vehicle in the the efforts to make sure that people are are safe from an oncoming hurricane and the the title of of that story is barbie and gator ken versus the hurricane as dismayed as i am to know that serving in the virginia national guard still stinks hundreds of years in the future I am thrilled to hear that. <laughs> I am thrilled that all of our fans of Chicks now have an additional reason to check out Dabare, and all of our fans of Dabare have a reason to suck out ch check out Chicks. That's called synergy, people. Now, for Worlds of Honor, what do you have in store for us there? Yes, in February, uh, what price victory is the next Worlds of Honor? I think it's Worlds of Honor seven. Uh, and that uh, I first I wrote my my first draft for that story back in 2015 and turned it into David and um, his his life had exploded and so that anthology got put on hold for for quite a while and so when he told me that it was it was going to be printed I. I claimed the opportunity to to do a revision because I learned a few things about writing in the last seven years, and also things had changed and and who had been invited and who was still part of the process. So I was able I had the word count that I could take what had been a, a long short story and make it actually a novella. Uh, I have a number of characters in in Grayson that have been my my character since my very first uh bane.com story and in this in this short story i get to take uh, a villain from the previous uh short story and and turn him into uh the main character without making anything that has been said about him untrue so a villain protagonist story interesting yep. Yep. Now, and he's not the character you will hate the most. <laughs> uh, when Tony Weisskopf read it and uh, at Liberty Con, uh, she was talking at the at the road show, and and the the character you will hate the most is is an intern, a female intern, and Tony what was talking about it and uh, mentioned that it. it that it, she was reading it and she, it made her really hate her. And I think it was David who pointed out, no, 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 the character, not Joelle. <laughs> she doesn't hate Joelle, she hates the character. 
Now, before we move on from the anthologies, I would be, again, horribly, horribly mistaken if I didn't bring up that you have been a relentless promoter, not just of the anthologies you're in, but all of Bane's anthologies, be it No Game for Nights, My Own World's Long Lost, Chicks and Tank Tops, Roping in Worlds of Honor. You have been a selfless promoter of your fellow authors. What I, I guess say selfless. I, I am very willing to have people also buy my books. And, and I, I, I happily accept retweets and shares of my promotional material. But there, there, there was just a really fun time when we were competing to see who had, who had the top new release science fiction anthology and and two of the three new releases weren't even out yet, but we're still in, still able to chart. And and it was fun to have a have have a war with people like Laurel K. Hamilton and Larry Correa and and be sniping back and forth about our fans are gonna beat their fans. And meanwhile, the fans were eating popcorn and and I was getting private messages from fans on ha ha ha, I bought the other guy's book and and um Casey Azell got at least a few private messages as well. Ha ha ha, I bought tank chicks and tank tops. <laughs> It was a good time. I mean, it's not every day you get Orson Scott Card, Laurel K. Hamilton, and Larry Correa roped into a fun flame war. But you, yeah. uh, in terms of rising tides raising all boats, you really showed that naval officer pedigree. And speaking of relentlessly sharing the limelight and bringing attention to officers. I, I think you got to be careful, Sean. You're, you're saying nice things about officers. You might be kicked out of out of the enlisted corps. <laughs> uh, the e <E-4> Mafia <laughs> will have my head. But <laughs> I have to say one of the other things that's been delightful is that you have been a relentless advocate for the growing boom in African science fiction and for African science fiction authors. For some of our yes, listeners. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who are wonderful writers and they are going to be successful no matter what. But if I can help introduce people, if I can help give people their opportunities sooner, that's definitely for the best. Um, Ogan Chevway, Donald Pecky has just been taking the awards um, world by storm but i i want his books to also sell well so he can get some money and so i i think um i i hope i've saw um he's got an anthology coming out uh, i think it releases either today or next week um africa risen but it is already sold out on amazon there they have no no physical copies yet left and i i'm just very happy for him he just won uh the world uh, fantasy award this last weekend for his anthology and he has in turn been extremely kind for me and um, gave me a, a very nice blurb on the back of my book. Um, Wale Talabi uh, is, um, hopefully you don't have to edit this out, uh, <laughs> uh, potentially going to be uh, writing for Bane for some short fiction and and he has what he is a fi he was a finalist this last year in uh, the Bain Memorial Award competition. Um, Hannah Onagwe uh, is an, another great writer. Usually, she's a little more focused on romance, and she's going to be uh, potentially writing in the next anthology that Marisa Wolf uh, does, uh, urban fantasy in the Chris Kennedy imprint, and. Um, so these three people and I believe uh, four more people uh, actually joined me for a, a, a attempt at a special event at Liberty Con last year. I held a meet and greet in my in my hotel room where I invited a bunch of a bunch of other writers and some editors and Tony Weisskopf came in and I had my friends from Nigeria on uh, different screens with the Zoom call and a bunch of food and coffee in the room to get people to come <laughs> and had people able to sit down and have a networking conversation, not recorded, not broadcast anywhere where they could just talk shop. And it was a brilliant time, believe me. And 
I don't think we need to edit that out at all, but it is uh, interesting <laughs> that between Hannah, Wole, and Ogan Chegwe, all three appear for the first time, but perhaps not the last time in a Bane book on the back of one of your own. And as much as you've been a wonderful advocate for them, what's it like getting that kind of praise from these authors? I, I was, I was really touched. I, I am an introvert. I was, I was very nervous when I was being encouraged by, by Bane people to reach out and, and ask, ask established writers and, um, people who are very established in other countries, but not as established here, um, if they would be willing to read my book, uh, early free copy, if they would consider giving it a blurb. Um, and, and these three people especially just ex responded so very warmly. And I, I was, I was touched at how, how easy they made it. And it gave me the confidence to then go and also talk to other people and, um, go to the bookstores and ask them, hey, can I do a signing here? And and I've had a lot of positive responses and you ha had to probably ask, you know, four times for everyone, yes, but I feel like that was a great rate. <laughs> and I will say for any of our listeners or viewers who might be unfamiliar with the field, African science fiction is booming similar to last decade what we saw with eastern european fantasy or chinese science fiction it's it might be one of the big international fields of the 2020s mm -hmm. do you do you have any recommendations for the folks watching or listening on where they might be able to start um well i already mentioned uh ogan chevroy's upcoming anthology um difficulty is sometimes things are not available for purchase in the United States easily. Um, Ogan Chevre has many of his award winning works that he is actually giving out for free now because with the difficulties with VPNs and so forth, uh, Amazon was awful and, and he wasn't able to continue to sell through them. Um, Wole Talabi is going to have uh, his first novel released in the United States coming out next year. Um, he is not quite final on the title. It's coming out from Daw. I think it's going to be Shadigi. And I might be pronouncing that name wrong. Um, S-H-I-D-I-G-I. -I -I. And it's, it's not available for pre-order yet, but I... Trust me, if you follow me on social media, if you get on my newsletter, I will be talking of his book when it is actually available. And as someone who's been such a friend and advocate for these authors and a friend and member of the Bain community for a while, has it been really happy to see this overlap grow and blossom into something new? Yes, I, I've been, I, I, as far as Bane authors go, I'm really a, a minnow at this point. And I, I hope to grow and become bigger and have, have the sales that, that make people be inclined to listen to what I say, even if they don't agree immediately with what it is to, to stop to think about it. But I, I've been, I've been very pleased with how willing uh, folks at Bane have been to to talk to my friends and to think about where they might be able to accept a submission from them and to not be held back by the fact that it would be difficult, more difficult to send the royalty payments through to an international bank than something just inside the United States or just in Canada. We've sent royalty payments to Afghanistan and Iraq before. Nigeria is probably a bit easier than both. <laughs> now, in addition to really bringing attention to this emerging field of science fiction, you yourself were, as you've mentioned earlier, and I'm happy to circle back to that, raised in West Africa. Could you go a little bit into that background yes. and what that was like living and being raised in Cameroon? Uh, my parents were missionaries. Um, so I was born in France while they were doing language training. There was a school 
in France uh, that taught people a bunch of different potential grammars for languages, a bunch of different ways to make sounds with their mouth that wouldn't necessarily exist in English, but exist in other languages. And some of them they wouldn't need, that they would be sounds that would be uh, pretty much only used in Asian languages, but some of them to, to train your ear to hear some of the different sounds that uh, there, there is a, a P kind of sound that when you say it, it to an American English ear, it's all the same sound. But if, if you're trying to, um, if you're in Israel, there's actually something like six different distinct sounds in there. And so being able to to learn bits and pieces about how languages work is what this school did. And they did that for a year. And then uh, they went to a very small village in Cameroon and did an immersive language learning where there weren't any books. There, there wasn't an app on their phone to help with translate. They just had to live among people, make their notes as best they could and, and, and learn it because that was the only language anyone was speaking at them. And that was, that was the beginning of their their career and and i was not even one and so i don't have a lot of memory of that village but my parents moved every two or three years within the united states and my parent i mean excuse me within Cameroon, and my parents are excellent at languages but um i am not um most cameroonian adults speak about four languages and it would be your home tribal language, probably another larger tribal language, usually Fulani, and then either French or English. But you pretty much pick up French or English in school. So if you're not in elementary school yet, and you're a kid, and you're trying to play with people, having a decent working knowledge of French does not work. And so <laughs> my family was moving around and I always, you know, wanted to go make friends and wanted to play and I am awful at languages. <laughs> However, I am in luck because Cameroon is very science and mathy. And there were a lot of games that were numbers based where you have a, a different assortment of holes in the ground and rocks as your tokens and you move the rocks around and this is how you play the game and you can learn what the local rules are just by watching and so it was it was glorious that I could I could play right away without even having any real language and so as I got older and through you know just sheer effort managed to pick up a little bit more language I really treasured the kind of words that were so useful that they were commonly used in many languages. And one of those words was dabere. And so that, that's part of why the, I, I wanted to use that in the title. And of course, it's also a, a science-y kind of word, which makes it even, even more precious to my, my nerd self. And that background absolutely flavors the dabere snake launcher. But before we move on to the next chapter of that, interesting background of yours. For any of our viewers, listeners, given that time in Cameroon, and of course, details about it in Dabare, what about the country should our readers know, or would you like them to know? Uh, Cameroon is a... Cameroon is to Nigeria as... Canada is the United States. It's, it's got a long border with Nigeria. It's about a quarter of the population. Um, the, the climate's not as nice as Nigeria. <laughs> um, so, with, and also uh, a large portion of Cameroon is, is Francophone while Nigeria um, many people in Nigeria speak English as, as one of their main languages. And so the, when I was first trying to find science fiction and fantasy writers, I looked first to Cameroon. I mean, I still, I still know people in Cameroon. I still know missionaries. I know Cameroonians. Um, but this is my first novel. 
and it's in English. It's not in French. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't publishing in the right language for my contacts. Um, and so I'm just all the more grateful for, for the, the Nigerian writers who I, you know, it, it wasn't a friend of a friend who introduced me to any of these people. It, it was me finding their names online and cold calling them. And, and they have been so kind and, and become good friends. Now, to go into the military chapter, I have to ask, how did a young woman raised in Cameroon end up in the U.S. Navy as an officer? Um, hi, Lynn. Uh, I, I was going to high school and um, trying to decide what to do with myself. I'd already written a first novel and submitted it places and had them send me back nice letters saying, no, thank you. You need to learn to write better. Uh, <laughs> and, but I, I did, I did know even then that I wanted to be that what I wanted to do with my life was to write. I just didn't have really a lot of assurance that I'd be able to make an income writing. And so I was looking for, I didn't want to spend money on college, but I, I was a nerd. I was, I was doing well in school. I, I took the PSATs and I got a perfect score. And so I was getting mailings from all these colleges that, okay, they, hey, I, I could have a full ride. And around that time, I, I got a mailing from West Point and uh, realized that in the United States, there are service academies where you don't have to pay to get a college degree. You have a guaranteed job afterwards. And oh, by the way, they allow women to serve in the military in the United States, which, which hadn't been, at least, I had never seen a female officer in the military in Cameroon. It's possible that they, they did have them and I just, they were just few enough. I hadn't noticed them. Um, and so I, I went to my parents and said, I'm going to go to West Point. And, and they did not like that idea <laughs> and they were absolutely against it. And so I, I had a, a week to work on them before I got the mailing from the U S Naval Academy and convinced them that, that that would be okay. And so I, I attended a, a, a week, uh, science camp at, at the Naval Academy and decided I loved it. And. Heinlein had get, gone there. It seemed like if I was going to go to college, I wanted to have a no, I didn't want to have to pay for it. I wanted a job afterwards. Um, and the idea of going into the military, serving for 20 years, and then retiring to somewhere with a low cost of living that I was going to live off of my military retirement pay and write for the rest of my life. And it wouldn't matter if I never convinced the publisher to, to buy my stuff. That, that was my big plan. Seemed to have worked out pretty well so far, but uh, I have to- Most of the way. I, I only served for six and a half years and, and then I got, I, I got sick, but mild, I, I'm not dying. Don't, don't worry anybody. But I just, I had to have a medical discharge because I wasn't perfect a hundred percent. But along the way, I met this cute guy named Andy Presby and, and we got together and now I've got a first reader who works for NASA. Life's pretty good. And I always want to ask our military veteran authors this, how has your military experience impacted your writing? And now that you're a veteran, has writing helped you at all as part of the transition back to civilian life? Kind of a two-parter there. Hmm. Um, well, I'm in the Navy doing deployments and then coming back um or rather having home ports overseas and then coming back i i felt like i'd already been transitioned back well before i i was actually discharged because i had a year in, in home port um i i value the the writing that that people do to help work on ptsd but that's not been it's not been for me formative. Has your military background shaped your writing at all? Hmm. I, I think uh, the time in the Navy allowed me to visit more places than I would have been able to get to otherwise because they 
they paid for the travel. Um, the it the time in the Navy made it clear how how when you're actually experiencing the kind of events that get made for TV movies or based on a true story um, movies made about them is that there is a lot of very boring setup um, with only very small, terrifying, but very important <laughs> critical choices that decide you know, whether or not your ship's gonna capsize. And so trying to, to capture that, that truth about reality and then also tell a story where the reader doesn't have to trudge through all the boring parts. I, I think that might've shaped my writing to some extent. Now, one thing, of course, with 20 years of war is one of the few upsides is we're seeing one of the biggest booms of veterans entering the field of science fiction and fantasy since the end of the Second World War. A big part of that has been a lot of female veterans entering the field. Yourself, Casey Ozell, just to name a couple. Has that been exciting to see happen? And do you have any theories as to why so many people are turning to genre fiction? Well, so many well, I think genre fiction is awesome. And <laughs> uh, it, I, I'm not sure if it, military science fiction often going together as opposed to the present day Tom Clancy, more kind of military fiction. Um, it could be that that it's a lot easier to get your security clearance reviewer to approve your military fiction if you make it military science fiction. But I I think most of us liked that kind of genre before we entered the service too. Now, of course, we are airing this on Veterans Day. I have to ask, any big Veterans Day plans, hitting up any restaurants, any ceremonies, or anything special? Well, right now I'm still in South Carolina um, having finished up meeting with David. And so I haven't had access to the local paper to see what is what is going on in Cleveland. Um, but I do have plans to uh, join Peter for a Veterans Roundtable recording for Culture Skate. And I think that's being recorded on Veterans Day and so it'll be released later. And a couple of our other authors will be joining that for all of our viewers and listeners who want to tune in. Now, the podcast is called Culture Escape. Uh, just confirming that one real quick. Yes, Culture Escape. Very good. Follow Bain on social media and we will share the links, along with some of our other Veterans Day plans. And I guess before we move on from veterans, uh, given Bain's Veterans Day plans, have any ships you plan to have some books out to? Um, I don't recall who we've mailed to already. Um, I I should point out that um, I have a a friendly competition going with Casey Azell of the Air Force and uh, Justin Watson of the Army to see who can accumulate the most uh, active duty or veterans units or hospitals or, or what have you to send ship to send. Uh, Bain books too, to and you know go navy. So let me know if you've got a ship or if you've got an army unit and you want me to have credit because <laughs> you're gonna tease Justin. Let me know. Now we just need to rope in Patrick Childs so we can get the Marine Corps. You know the Marines that know how to read anyway. Marine Corps is honorary with the Department of Navy. Well, we'll see what he has to say about that the next time you have him on the show. <laughs> Uh, Patrick Childs is going to be joining me uh, uh, Saturday, November 12th, up at uh, wonderful local independent bookstore, Max Bax, Books on Coventry. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a book signing, and uh, Marie Viebert will be there also. And then coming up November 17th, down in Columbus, Ohio, uh, the Book Loft bookstore will be having myself and Patrick Childs and Dan Colbert there for a signing event. So for our Buckeye Bane fans, we'll be having two big signings this month. So be sure to make the trek and say hello. 
No. Now, we are towards the tail end here. Can I ask what you're working on next? What you're working I on currently? I am finishing up Multiverse 4 um, with David to get that turned in quickly. And then I'm going to be doing a, a week or two of intensive brainstorming and polishing up my outline for the next Dabare novel. Do we have a prospective title for it yet? Any ideas for the plot? Not yet. Not yet. But I do have one saved around. Whether you can come to uh, Max Bax or to the Book Loft, if you are anywhere near Ohio, you should put on your calendar uh, Memorial Day 2023 to uh, come attend Marcon Columbus, Multiple Alternate Realities Convention. Uh, it's it's going to be a great time. You'll have me, you'll have Patrick, you'll have Dan, and uh, David and Sharon Weber, we're going to be the, up there as guests of honor. We're finally getting them to come to Ohio. So be sure to mark your calendars. I for hear next. Sean is too busy. He's he's focused on, you know, bringing forth the next generation of readers. So we will probably not get Sean. Yeah, for those who don't know, I'm expecting my firstborn child on May 4th. So as much as I would love to be at Marcon with all of our Midwestern authors, I'm pretty sure my wife will kill me if I leave her with a three-week-old newborn. So perhaps next year, year well, after. If you're thinking about going, get your convention membership now while well, it's still a little bit cheaper. And definitely, definitely be sure to keep an eye on some of our other plans for the Midwest next year. We have a fine group of authors out, out there, and we are... Very excited to let them hit the bricks and showcase that. So I guess before we bring things to a close for all of our folks watching and viewing, is there anything you'd like to tell them? Um, I thank you for all the messages I've been receiving. People keep, keep pinging my phone or Facebook Messenger or Twitter DMs and telling me I just finished Dabare and I love it. And, I, I just thank you. It, I really, really appreciate it. I went to Steading Day's uh, science fiction convention this weekend, and uh, uh, fan Wendy gave me these beautiful snake earrings in honor of Mami Wata. I, I really appreciate the, the positive encouragement I've, I've had from, from all of fandom. Then I suppose we should close by once again wishing all of our viewers and listeners a happy Veterans Day and telling them to Veterans Day. check out the Dabare Snake Launcher, available in bookstores, Amazon, and Bain.com, and wherever else fine books are sold. And of course, one of our books on sale for the Veterans Sale all November long. Thank you. And now we bring you Timothy Zahn's Cobra. Earth's only hope was the Cobras. The colony world's Adirondack and Silvern fell to the troughed forces almost without a struggle. Outnumbered and on the defensive, Earth made a desperate decision. It would attack the aliens not from space, but on the ground with forces the troughs did not even suspect. Thus were created the Cobras, a guerrilla force whose weapons were surgically implanted, invisible to the unsuspecting eye, yet undeniably deadly. But power brings temptation, and not all the Cobras could be trusted to fight for Earth alone. Johnny Moreau would learn the uses and abuses of his special abilities and what it truly meant to be a Cobra. For many years, the only ground link between Cedar Lake and the tiny farming community to the southwest, Boyar, was a bumpy one and three quarters lane perm turf road that paralleled the Shard Mountains to the west. It had been considered adequate for so long simply because there was little in or around Boyar that anyone in Cedar Lake would want. Boyar's crops went to Horizon City by way of New Perseus. Supplies traveled the same route in reverse. Now, however, all that had changed. A large vein of the cesium-bearing ore polycite had been discovered north of Boyar, and as the mining companies moved in, so did the road construction crews. 
The facility for extracting the cesium was, for various technical reasons, being built near Cedar Lake, and a multi-lane highway would be necessary to get the ore to it. Johnny found the road foreman near a large outcrop of granite that lay across the road's projected path. Uh, you Samson Grange? he asked. Yeah, you? Johnny Moreau. Mr. Oberland told me to check with you about a job. I've had training in lasers, explosives, and sonic blasting equipment. Well, actually, kid, I... Uh, wait a minute. Johnny Moreau the Cobra? Ex-Cobra, yes. Grain shifted his spit stick in his mouth, eyes narrowing slightly. Yeah, I can use you, I guess. Straight level eight pay. That was two levels up from minimum. Fine. Thanks very much. Johnny nodded toward the granite outcrop. You need this out of the way? Yeah, but that'll keep. Come on back here a minute. He led Johnny to where a group of eight men were struggling to unload huge rolls of pre-top paper from a truck to the side of the new road. It took three or four men to handle each roll, and they were puffing and swearing with the effort. Boys, this is Johnny Moreau, Grange told him. Johnny, we've got to get this stuff out right away so the truck can go back for another load. Give him a hand, okay? Without waiting for an answer, he strode off. Reluctantly, Johnny clambered onto the truck. This wasn't exactly what he'd had in mind. The other men regarded him coolly, and Johnny heard the word Cobra being whispered to the two or three who hadn't recognized him. Determined not to let it throw him, he stepped over to the nearest roll and said, Can someone give me a hand with this? Nobody moved. Wouldn't we just be in the way? One of them, a husky laborer, suggested with more than a little truculence. Johnny kept his voice steady. Look, I'm willing to do my share. That seems fair, someone else said sarcastically. It was our taxes that paid to make you into a superman in the first place, and I figure Grange is paying you enough money for four men. So fine, we got the first eight rolls down and you can get the last five. That fair enough, men? There was a general murmur of agreement. Johnny studied their faces for a moment, looking for some sign of sympathy or support but all he saw was hostility and wariness. All right, he said softly. Bending his knees slightly, he hugged the roll of pretop to his chest. Servos whining in his ears, he straightened up and carefully carried the roll to the end of the truck bed. Setting it down, he jumped to the ground, picked it up again, and placed it off the road with the others. Then, hopping back into the truck, he went to the next roll. None of the other workers had moved but their expressions had changed. Fear now dominated everything else. It was one thing, Johnny reflected bitterly, to watch films of cobras shooting up troughs on the plate. It was something else entirely to watch one lift 200 kilos right in front of you. Cursing inwardly, he finished moving the rolls as quickly as possible, and then, without a word, went off in search of Samson Grange. He found the other busy inventorying sacks of hardener mix, and was immediately pressed into service to carry them to the proper workers. That job led to a succession of similar tasks over the next few hours. Johnny tried to be discreet, but the news about him traveled faster than he did. Most of the workers were less hostile toward him than the first group had been, but it was still like working on a stage, and Johnny began to fume inwardly at the wary politeness and sidelong glances. Finally, just before noon, he caught on, and once more he tracked down the foreman. I don't like being maneuvered by people, Mr. Grange, he told the other angrily. I signed on here to help with blasting and demolition work. Instead, you got me carrying stuff around like a pack mule. Grange slid his spit stick to a corner of his mouth and regarded Johnny coolly. I signed you up at level eight to work on the road. I never said what you were going to do. That's rotten. You knew what I wanted. So what? What the hell? You want special privileges or something? I got guys who have certificates in demolition work. I should replace them with a kid who's never even seen a real tape on the subject. Johnny opened his mouth, but none of the words he wanted to say would come out. Grain shrugged. Well, look, kid, he said, not unkindly. I got nothing against you. Hell, I'm a vet myself. But you haven't got any training or experience in road work. We can use more laborers, sure. And that super-revved body of yours makes you worth at least two men. That's why I'm paying you level eight. Other than that, frankly, you aren't worth much to us. Take it or don't. It's up to you. 
Thanks, but no go, Johnny gritted out. Okay. Grange took out a card and scribbled on it. Take this to the main office in Cedar Lake and they'll give you your pay. And come back if you change your mind. Johnny took the card and left, trying to ignore the hundred pairs of eyes he could feel boring into his back. The house was deserted when he arrived home, a condition for which he was grateful. He'd had time to cool down during the drive and now just wanted some time to be alone. As a cobra, he'd been unused to flat-out failure. If the troughs foiled an attack, he had simply to fall back and try a new assault. But the rules here were different, and he wasn't adjusting to them as quickly as he'd expected to. Nevertheless, he was a long way yet from defeat. Punching up last night's news sheet, he turned to the employment section. Most of the jobs being offered were level 10 laborer types, but there was a fair sprinkling of the more professional sort that he was looking for. Settling himself comfortably in front of the plate, he picked up the pad and stylus always kept by the phone and began to make notes. His final list of prospects covered nearly two pages, and he spent most of the rest of the afternoon making phone calls. It was a sobering and frustrating experience. And in the end he found himself with only two interviews, both for the following morning. By then it was nearly dinner time. Stuffing the pages of notes into a pocket, he headed for the kitchen to offer his mother a hand with the cooking. Irena smiled at him as he entered. "'Any luck with the job hunt?' she asked. "'A little,' he told her. She had arrived home some hours earlier and had already heard a capsule summary of his morning with the road crew. "'I've got two interviews tomorrow, Svetlana of Electronics and Outworld Mining, and I'm lucky to get even that many.' She patted his arm. "'You'll find something. Don't worry.' A sound outside made her glance out the window. "'Your father and Jamie are home.' Oh, and there's someone with them. Johnny looked out. A second car had pulled up to the curb behind Pierce and Jamie. As he watched, a tall, somewhat paunchy man got out and joined the other two in walking toward the house. He looks familiar, Mommer, but I can't place him. That's Teague Stillman, the mayor, she identified him, sounding surprised. I wonder why he's here. Whipping off her apron, she dried her hands and hurried into the living room. Johnny followed more slowly unconsciously taking up a backup position across the living room from the front door. The door opened just as Irena reached it. Hi, honey, Pierce greeted his wife as the three men entered. Teague stopped by the shop just as we were closing up, and I invited him to come over for a few minutes. How nice, Irena said in her best hostess voice. It's been a long time since we've seen you, Teague. How is Shireen? She's fine, Irena, Stillman said. Although she says she doesn't see me enough these days either. Actually, I just stopped by to see if Johnny was home from work yet. Yes, I am, Johnny said, coming forward. Congratulations on winning your election last year, Mr. Stillman. I'm afraid I didn't make it to the polls. Stillman laughed and reached out his hand to grasp Johnny's briefly. He seemed relaxed and friendly. And yet, right around the eyes, Johnny could see a touch of the caution that he'd seen in the road workers. "'I'd have sent you an absentee ballot if I'd known exactly where you were,' the mayor joked. "'Welcome home, Johnny.' "'Thank you, sir.' "'Shall we sit down?' Irena suggested. They moved into the living room proper, Stillman and the Moreau parents exchanging small talk all the while. Jamie had yet to say a word, Johnny noted, and the younger boy took a seat in a corner away from the others. "'The reason I wanted to talk to you, Johnny,' Stillman said when they were all settled, was that the city council and I would like to have a sort of welcome-home ceremony for you in the park next week. Nothing too spectacular, really. Uh, just a short parade through town, followed by a couple of speeches. You don't have to make one if you don't want to. And then some fireworks and perhaps a torchlight procession. What do you think? Johnny hesitated, but there was no way to say this diplomatically. Thanks, but I really don't want you to do that. Pierce's proud smile vanished. What do you mean, Johnny? Why not? Because I don't want to get up in front of a whole bunch of people and get cheered at. It's embarrassing, and... Well, it's embarrassing. I don't want any fuss made over me. Johnny, the town wants to honor you for what you did, Stillman said soothingly, as if afraid Johnny was becoming angry. That thought was irritating. The greatest honor it could give me would be to stop treating me like a freak, he retorted. Son, Pierce began warningly, Dadder, if Johnny doesn't want any official hoopla, it seems to me the subject is closed, Jamie spoke up unexpectedly from his corner. 
unless you all plan to chain them to the speaker's platform. There was a moment of uncomfortable silence. Then Stillman shifted in his seat. Well, if Johnny doesn't want this, there's no reason to discuss it further. He stood up, the others quickly following suit. I really ought to get home now. Give Shireen our best, Irena said. I will. Stillman nodded. We'll have to try and get together soon. Goodbye, all. And once more, welcome home, Johnny. I'll walk you to your car, Pierce said, clearly angry but trying to hide it. The two men left. Irena looked questioningly at Johnny, but all she said before disappearing back into the kitchen was, You boys wash up and call Gwen from her room. Dinner will be ready soon. You okay? Jamie asked softly when his mother had gone. Yeah. Thanks for backing me up. Johnny shook his head. They don't understand. I'm not sure I do either. Is it because of what I said about people being afraid of you? That has nothing to do with it. The people of Adirondack were afraid of us too, some of them. But even so... Johnny sighed. Look, Horizon is all the way across the Dominion from where the war was fought. You weren't within fifty light years of a trough even at their deepest penetration. How can I accept the praise of people who have no idea what they're cheering for? It'd just be going through the motions. He turned his head to stare out the window. Adirondack held a big victory celebration after the troughs finally pulled out. There was nothing of duty or obligation about it. When the people cheered, you could tell they knew why they were doing so. And they also knew who they were there to honor. Not those of us who were on the stage, but those who weren't. Instead of a torchlight procession, they sang a requiem. He turned back to face Jamie. How could I watch Cedar Lake's fireworks after that? Jamie touched his brother's arm and nodded silently. I'll go call Gwen, he said a moment later. Pierce came back into the house. He said nothing, but flashed Johnny a disappointed look before disappearing into the kitchen. Sighing, Johnny went to wash his hands. Dinner was very quiet that evening. That was another installment in Timothy Zahn's Cobra. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks as always to audible.com and podcast theme composer, Ruth Judkiewicz. And good night, Tony Daniel, wherever you are. This is David F. Shirod coming to you from a soundproof bunker somewhere deep in the heart of Texas. Join us here next week at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars.